Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Christian Church of Austin, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon from Sunday, May 25th, 2014 is entitled, A Very Different Drummer. It's a reflection on a reading from 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 22. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at United Christian Church, head over to our website, www.uccaustin.org. Thank you. Now who will harm you if you are eager, eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for our sins once, <coughs> excuse me, for all the righteous, for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Friends, God is still speaking to the world. May our hearts be open to listen and respond. Amen. So already going into it, our reading today from the epistle, the first letter of Peter, has two strikes going against it. The first, of course, is that it is, in fact, an epistle. And we have to remember that epistle is just the fancy Bible word for letter. But it was the word that anyone of that day would have used to describe any sort of letter. You would have run down to your P.O. box at the local Roman market and picked up your epistles. It's just a letter. But as with any letter, it's a little bit odd to be reading just one letter because we know there are letters going to and fro preceding all of these letters of the early church. In fact, it's much like listening to only one side of a telephone conversation. You remember when we used to use our phones to actually talk to people. Maybe it's like one side of a text message conversation, just the one side. More than that, of course, in the co course of this conversation, the writers aren't making grand theological points for the most part. They're reflecting on issues that are arising in these new communities of faith. They're responding to particular situations in particular congregations, perhaps to the budget shortfall at the church at Corinth, or there's a fight on the potluck committee in the church at Thessalonica. Who knows? It's as if someone took my lead letter from the latest church newsletter put a title on it, called it the first letter to the Austinites, and commended it to the Church Universal for their reflection and meditation for the next 2,000 years. Please, God, no. In this case, in the case of 1 Peter, the letter itself is particularly obtuse. Just listening to it as it flows by in the course of the reading, all that stuff about suffering, and then somehow Noah and the ark bobs to the surface at the end of the letter and a lot about baptism as well, and then this odd phrase in the middle about Christ going to make a proclamation to the spirits in prison. And let the church say, what? <laughs> it's okay, breathe, we'll get through it together. The second challenge for us in approaching this letter is in the way that we read. We have been trained 
not just in church, but in life in general through the SAT and other tests for reading comprehension. We've been tra trained to read for causality, to look for the if this, then that statements throughout the course of a reading. We want that through line that tells us what to do, that points directly to the wrap up, the big major point that we're supposed to get. We're supposed to read these, we're told, like stereo instructions in a way. Insert tab A into slot B, yield salvation C. Which might, might be okay if this were a sermon or a lecture or in fact stereo instructions but definitely not in a letter. See above, re-reflecting and responding. Since the writers weren't really driving toward a big theological point, but in fact jumping off from one to wade out into the waters of messy everyday life in the middle of the early church, it may be best for us as we approach these readings to look first for that main point and then read backward. Not like Hebrew reading right to left, but starting with that main point and watching as it gets worked out through the course of the letter. Oddly enough, in most of the epistles, in fact, it's the very same point that's being made we make every single Sunday in our children's sermons. That God loves you, God loves everyone else just as much, and God wants you to love everyone else too. On these points hang all the law and the prophets. In this case, in the course of 1 Peter 3, 13 through 20, the image of God's love that's made for us, that's made plain for us and laid out, is baptism. The author is telling his audience that they should be reminded in their baptism about just how much God loves them. That Jesus was, in fact, born, lived, suffered, died, and was raised to share this love with them, this love that takes the form of baptism now in the sacrament and love not just for them, but for their sisters and brothers in the church. Not just for those who come from Jewish backgrounds, but also Gentiles. Not just those who deserve God's love in the eyes of the world, in our eyes. But those who don't. Particularly those who don't. Even those persons under judgment. Even those spirits in prison. There's that odd phrase again in the middle of the epistle. What the heck does that mean? And here comes the controversy. How many people remember the Apostles' Creed? I don't mean remember the Apostles' Creed in general. How many people here could recite the Apostles' Creed? How many people here grew up reciting the Apostles' Creed? All right, so I'm going to guess that you did not, in fact, grow up in the congregational tradition or in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ or any of our other non-creedal background churches, churches where we treat these historical confessions like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Westminster Catechism, as wonderful and powerful testimonies of faith, but not tests of faith. I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, so we said the Apostles' Creed. Even more so, I grew up going to a chapel in Episcopal school for 12 years, five days a week, and we said the Apostles' Creed. But even so, getting ready for the sermon, just to make sure I didn't screw it up, I had to look it up. And so I'd invite those of you who remember to say those first lines with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The scholars are clear, they're not clear what the words there in chapter 3, verse 19 really, really mean, and isn't that refreshing? It is the consensus of some 2,000 years of lived faith in the church that this is what that line means means. That even after he died, Jesus still had work to do. We might feel we could identify with that. That even after he died, Jesus descended into hell. There to make plain God's liberating love. To make it real and alive for those spirits in prison all the way down there. Now a disclaimer at this point. 
I do not believe in hell. I don't believe in the devil either, but that's probably a whole other sermon. Now, I announced that at the 8.30 service in the course of this sermon, and someone came up to me afterwards with a, a comment and a question, and this is a further disclaimer. Beware what you ask me after earlier services. You might just show up in a later sermon. But someone came up to me and asked, so was I right in hearing that you don't believe in hell? I said, yes. And they said, I'd have a hard time with that. I know some pretty terrible people. To which I responded, yes, but I know a really great God. I refuse to believe that a really great God, a truly loving God, in fact, a truly just God, would create the entire universe like sort of a game show. One giant episode of Survivor where if you don't manage to come up with the right answer before the buzzer goes off, I'm sorry, but your elevator only goes down forever. I understand hell. I understand our human need to create a hell and a devil to run it. I just don't believe in it because I believe in God more. Which begs the question, once again, this odd line, what does this part of the passage have to say to me or to us? Here we go back to that underlying point again. God loves you. God loves everyone else just as much. God loves you and everyone else so much that God will do anything. God will suffer anything to show us that love. God will go to any length to make that love real for us, all of us, every last one of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we are on life's journey, even in our own very own hell or someone else's. Poetically and faithfully put, God in Jesus will suffer to be crucified, dead, and buried, and even descend into hell to preach to those spirits in prison, not because suffering is so wonderful in and of itself and to be commended to us, but rather God's goal is so important to love every square inch of creation that ever was, that is, that ever will be into new, rich, lush, abundant, eternal life wherever and whenever we are. Which is a beautiful idea. The gospel is full of beautiful ideas and hard work. Because Christ calls us to follow in his footsteps not just prettily along the sands of the beach, but all the way to hell and back. It's not a popular sentiment in many Christian circles these days, particularly in congregations where they preach that prosperity gospel, that idea that, again, something like a game show, we who manage to confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are really the big winners in life, and there are prizes waiting for us, not just in heaven, but here on earth. Those churches may talk about going to hell and back, but the emphasis is firmly on the backside, on the happily ever after of the fairy tale, not on the deep, dark woods that come before the deep, dark woods where too many of us live day after day in situations of very real suffering. Now again, these days, it's popular in some Christian circles to talk about how much we're suffering for our faith, but I want to be clear. The kind of suffering that I'm talking about is not the mere inconvenience of having to share the opening prayers at the city council meetings with Jews and Muslims and atheists. Oh my, that's not suffering. That's just sharing. I'm talking about real suffering, life and death suffering, and death in the midst of life suffering, hell on earth suffering. We all know that your soul doesn't have to be in the burning hell of Dante or Milton for your spirit to be imprisoned. Too many of God's children suffer under judgment here and now. Join me for a moment. Cast your heart about And think of all those persons who live imprisoned lives 
in our world today. In the hell of addiction. In the hell of mass incarceration. In the hell of hunger. In the hell of isolation and loneliness. In the hell of daily oppression for who they are. In the hell of war. Friends, that's where Jesus went. That's where the risen Christ continues to go to those folks who are in hell and need his healing touch. That's where God's love goes to get down to the real work of redemption and reconciliation and resurrection. And if we're going to claim the name Christian for ourselves, that's where we have to go too. A friend and I were talking the other night and we were cracking ourselves up, talking about the difference between what it is to be really like Jesus or merely sort of Jesus-ish. That's the question for us, really, isn't it? As we sit here in the middle of a world steeped in suffering, are we willing to really be like Jesus, to in fact do what Jesus would do? Or are we content as a church to be just Jesus? The world is full of Jesusness. God knows the church is full of it. Church is full of sentimental faith that wants the reward but not the responsibility. Churches on all sides of every aisle, full of prophetic fire but devoid of true compassion and humanity and humility. The world is full of Jesusness. What the world, the world really needs now is a living body of Christ, a body full of living justice and peace and compassion, not just words, not just a dumb show, not just a rinky-dink little ark fit to save only a few from a flood of daily suffering, but an outpouring of God's love that will bring good news to the poor, proclamation of release to the captives, and let the oppressed go free, good news that goes to hell and breaks it open. If we want to be a church of a cross and an empty tomb, of a Good Friday and an Easter, if we want to be more than merely a chapel of ease, a little oasis in the middle of a messy world, if we're serious about following Jesus, we have to be willing to go with him, to follow him, to go where he goes every step of the way. We don't get to skip ahead to glory. We don't get to pass go. We certainly don't get to collect $200. What we do get is out of jail free. All of us. Again, that's the point. But the moment we do, the moment that good news lights us up, we're reminded that free people go on to free people. That Jesus calls us out and then sends us back. Sends us back into the same hellish places to spread the good news, to break the locks, to lead them out, to lead them all out, to leave no man or woman or child behind. And if necessary, to sit there in solidarity with them in the midst of their suffering and to suffer ourselves until we can all walk out together. In this game of Survivor, everyone survives. It's not much of a sales pitch, really. No wonder recruitment is down. Certainly it isn't the way of the world around us. The way to win friends and influence people, important people. But it's the way Jesus offers us. It's his own way. Not the way over or around, but the way down and in and through. This is the only tune our very different drummer knows. The only marching music our faith offers us. And the only question left is, will we step to it? As the old song says, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. 
Not because God doesn't want them, not because God won't get them there, but because some of us aren't even headed in the same general direction. Some of us are miles off. But I believe God will bring us all over into glory in God's good time and by God's good grace. Thank God. But here's my hope. I'd like to hope that as a church baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we may yet learn to walk his walk along the way. Baby steps. But in the right direction. This is the hopeful account of my faith I'd like to show by my life to anybody who might care to look. It's a funny kind of hope because if we do follow him, we sure are going to suffer at the hands of a world that's marching as fast as it possibly can in exactly the opposite direction. We will suffer as he suffered, but we will not be alone. Even in hell, we will not be alone. And all those we suffer with in his name won't be alone either. And together, our lives will mean that much more. As his life did. As his life does. Together with him and with one another, our living, our suffering, our dying, even our descent into hell will make a difference and help bring all souls that much closer to heaven. Real heaven. Heaven here. So friends, if you've heard the word of God preached here today, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hit him, my leader. Hit him, hit him, hit him.